Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. In the last lecture, we saw that conservation and economics are both related to each other. Both are being done for the common aim of providing more and more benefits to more and more number of people. But still, in certain cases, there are difficulties because there are some people who might consider that economics and conservation are at loggerheads. They are not serving the same purpose. So, the solution lies in having more and more economics. So the people who are there in a position of decision making, they need to be made aware that if we are doing good conservation, this is also going to be bringing benefits to a large number of people. And a good example is the provisioning of mitigation structures such as underpasses for the movement of wild animals. Now, underpasses not only provide a way for wild animals to move uh, across a road, but they also provide protection to people because they will not find a wild animal out there in the road to collide with their vehicles, to destroy the vehicle and probably also uh, lead to the death of, a, of uh, some human beings in these accidents. If we do not have underpasses, the other option for people to move safely is to lower their speeds. So in a number of areas, we find that there is a speed limit uh, regulation of say around 20 kilometers per hour. But then if we go with a speed of 20 kilometers per hour, that also leads to certain uh, detriments to, to a large number of people because goods will move slowly, people will move slowly. And so in such a situation, uh, doing development of the area will be more difficult. So the issue here is to bring the economists and the ecologists on the same page and come up with certain solutions through which uh, we can find a means to satisfy both the uh, circumstances. It is important to know the language of both these people. It is important to know the language of economists and the language of the ecologists. And in this lecture, we'll have a look at the language of the economist. We'll have a look at how an economist thinks and how he or she takes a decision. In particular, to use economics, we must know economics. And in this lecture, we will look at certain terms, terms of economist, or let us say the lingo of the street. We'll also have a look at the methods that are employed. Now, different disciplines might be using different methods. Now, there are some methods that are specific to a field. However, there are certain methods that are common across all fields, such as the scientific method. So we'll have a look at what kinds of methods are used in economics. We'll also uh, try to discern what are the kinds of analysis that are done in this field. And then we'll also look at what are the field realities. So let us begin with the terms. So there are a number of terms in economics and to understand any field, it is important that we know the language of the field. So for instance, when an economist says that the market is going up or the market is going down or the market is essential for such and such society or the market says so, what does this, this market refer to? Is he referring to your local market? Is he referring to the stock market? Is he referring to something else? So to understand the language of an economist, it is important to know the terms that an economist uses. So for instance, a market is defined as a group of buyers and sellers of a particular good of, or service. It is a group of buyers and sellers, which means that you cannot have a market 
with say just a few buyers or just a few sellers or say just one buyer and one seller they, that will not make a market you require a large number of buyers and a large number of sellers and these are buyers and sellers of a particular good or service which means that we can have different kinds of markets we can have a market for goods we can have a market for services in the case of market for goods we can have a market for, for say wood we can have a market for land we can have a market for construction activities in the case of services we can have a market of education now in any of these markets there are certain people who want to procure these goods and services and these people are known as the buyers and there are certain other people who provide these goods and services to the buyers and these people who provide these goods and services are known as the sellers now in any market you will have a group of buyers and a group of sellers for that particular good or service then we have quantity demanded quantity demanded of any good or service is the amount of good that the will, that the buyers are willing and able to purchase quantity demanded is the amount of good that buyers are willing so they must be willing and they must be able to purchase which means that when we look at quantity demanded if there is a section of buyers that says okay i am going to procure this item for say 2 lakhs of rupees i am willing to do that but then those buyers do not have the funds with them so they are not able to provide this much amount of money so in that case we will not include that uh, section into the computation of the quantity demanded or there might be certain people who have money with them but they do not want to spend it on that particular good or service and in that case as well we will not include it in the definition of quantity demanded so the quantity demanded is the amount of goods that buyers are willing and able to purchase now it is very important in the case of conservation because there is a market for a lot number of goods that are to the detriment of nature and ecology so for instance there is a market for tiger skin now why is there a market for tiger skin because there are certain buyers who want to procure tiger skin there are certain sellers who want to sell tiger skin now where will these sellers get the tiger skin from of course they will go into a forest and they will poach a tiger now if there is this market and you want to Uh, to curtail this market you want to stop this market so it is important to know how these people are providing these goods and services where this market is and what is the quantity that is being demanded by this market because to stop this market you will have to act at different levels you will have to act at the level of the buyers so if somebody is trying to buy these tiger skins you would have to stop them you have to act at the level of the sellers and then you also have to act at the level of the market now remember that market is a group of buyers and sellers of a particular good or service and these days the online marketplace has also come up as a very important market now when we look at the online marketplace at times you will find that even on the most reputed uh, online marketplaces there might be certain people who are selling products such as a claw of a tiger or say the skin of a snake and so if you want to perform conservation you will have to act at the level of these market segments so it is important to know what is the market who is the buyer who is the seller what is the quantity demanded what is the quantity supplied and then you can even act at this level how do you reduce the willingness of the buyer how do you reduce the ability of the buyer to purchase a thing such as a tiger skin so willingness of the buyer can be reduced by say coming up with certain means of education or awareness or by say uh, uh, putting up uh, a social cost or putting up um, uh, certain excessive taxation or excessive uh, punishment if uh, if anybody comes to know that that such and such person 
uh, has bought a tiger skin or you could even uh, act at the level of ability so if you know who are the buyers who preferentially try to buy a tiger skin you might try to reduce their ability to purchase a tiger skin now this uh, reduction of the ability can be through say uh, uh, more taxation of those people or say by freezing up of their accounts now if you freeze the account of a potential buyer so in that case this buyer is no longer able to procure the goods and so the amount of quantity demanded in the market will go down and as the quantity demanded goes down the price will go down and it will no longer be profitable for the seller to go and poach a tiger and bring it to the market so it is important to know what is the quantity demanded similarly you need to know the quantity that is supplied the amount of a good that sellers are willing and able to sell so the sellers must be willing and they must be able okay. here again there could be certain sellers that are willing to sell a good such as tiger skin but they are unable to sell it because they do not have access to the resources or there could be certain sellers who have uh, the ability to hunt a tiger but they are not willing and in a number of cases we find that there are people who live around a tiger reserve so these people have access to the tiger but tiger conservation has been successful only because these people are unwilling to go into the forest and poach a tiger so we also have to work at the level of the willingness and the ability of the sellers or the potential sellers so these are some important terms in economics another term is elasticity elasticity is a measure of the responsiveness of quantity demanded or supplied to a change in one of its determinants so essentially if you look at say a thing such as apply a, a price elasticity of demand it is percentage change in the quantity demanded divided by percentage change in the price so essentially if there is a change in one or more of the determinants of a good then is the the quantity demanded or quantity supplied does it change or not now if there is a good for which when there is a change in its determinants and the amount of quality uh, or the uh, or the quantity of uh, goods that are supplied or the the goods that are bought if it changes then we'll say that the demand or the supply curve is elastic whereas in certain other cases uh, if the demand or the uh, if the quantity demanded or the quantity supplied if it remains the same then we'll say that the the demand or supply for such and such good or service is inelastic now it has been seen that in the case of certain goods such as say food grains the demand and supply are very inelastic and why are they inelastic because even if say a person has access to more amount of funds or if the person shifts to some other place there is a limit to how much amount of food grains he or she can eat and so the the quantity that is demanded is more or less fixed similarly in the case of a number of industrial products it is difficult to change the quantity that is supplied on a short term basis and so this uh, the supply of such goods and services will be called as inelastic there are also other terms such as comparative advantage externality and so on and we'll explore all these different terms as we move through the course next let us have a look at the methods of economics and the most important method that we make use of is the scientific method now scientific method works like this there is an observation and any observation can lead to a question so for instance there is an observation that there is a market for tiger body parts the question is okay what are the determinants of this market does this market depend on say uh, 
who is the buyer or who is the seller or does it does this market depend on what the currency exchange rate is or does this market depend on what is the level of insurgency in areas where you have the tigers so that it is easy to poach the tigers so there could be a number of questions that can be asked based on any observation now based on any of these questions we can come up with certain hypotheses now a hypothesis is a possible explanation for what is going on now this possible explanation could be correct or it could be incorrect but so it be the hypothesis has to be formed so for instance we can say we can say formulate a hypothesis that there is this uh, market for say food grains and the market for food uh, and the amount of uh, food grains that is supplied to this market depends on say the cost of fertilizers now it is possible say that uh, in this area fertilizers um, are very expensive as compared to the other raw materials that are needed to uh, manufacture food grains and so if the price of fertilizers goes up then people will uh, be unable to procure more and more fertilizers and so the amount of fertilizers that are uh, applied to the crops will go down and so the the quantity that is supplied will go down it is possible but there could also be a situation that the fertilizers are very cheap as compared to say the cost of irrigation and so there is hardly any impact of the cost of or of the price of fertilizers on the quantity of food grains that is supplied in this market now whether a hypothesis is true or not it will have to be discerned but before we get to the task of discerning why a thing is happening in a certain manner we will first have to formulate a hypothesis so we can say formulate n number of hypotheses we can say that the uh, that the quantity of uh, food grains that is supplied to this market depends on the price of fertilizers or it depends on uh, say the price of irrigation or it say depends on the price of transportation there could be n number of hypotheses and then we will try to look at each and uh, every one of these hypotheses in more detail now how do we look at or how do we discern a hypothesis it is done either through experiments or through observations now what can uh, uh, what can be an experiment so suppose we wanted to see if uh, the price of fertilizers is the most important factor that determines how much is the amount of food grains that is supplied by a seller so in that case we can artificially pick certain um, farmers and we can provide them with fertilizers at say a reduced rate so we can provide them with certain subsidy we can tell them that okay if you purchase 1 kg of fertilizers we are going to pay you 20% of the money you will you'll only have to pay 80% of the sum so in place of a higher price now the farmer is paying a lower price and then we can formulate certain groups we can say that there is this cohort that is paying a uh, 100% price there is the second cohort that is paying 90% price there is a third cohort that is paying 80% price and so on and then we can try to to look at what is the amount of food grains that is supplied by these different cohorts into the market so this can be an experiment or in certain cases when it is difficult to perform experiment we can even look at more number of observations so for instance we can say that okay if everything else remains same but then also the price of fertilizers would be varying to some extent or probably there are different places in our uh, area of study and in one place the price of fertilizers is more in another place the price of fertilizers is less and everything else is more or less the same so in that case the the scientist or the economist might try to to figure out if these natural variations in the prices have got something to do with the quantity of food grains that these different sellers provide to the market so we can explore a hypothesis either through experiments or through observations and when we do these experiments and observations it is possible that the hypothesis gets rejected so 
it is possible that we formulated all these different cohorts we give gave them different amounts of subsidies but still every cohort provides the same amount of food grains or supplies the same amount of food grains to the market so in that case we will reject the hypothesis that the price of fertilizers has the the uh, the majority share in determining the uh, the amount of food grains that are supplied by the seller to the market so this is a, a hypothesis that gets rejected through either the experiments or through the observations and when this happens then we will go ahead with the next hypothesis or we will even formulate a new hypothesis so in this case we might say that okay uh, the uh, the price of uh, fertilizers has nothing to to do with the uh, with the quantity of food grains that we, these people are supplying so probably it is the price of transportation so that is the new hypothesis that the price of transportation governs the quantity of food grains that are supplied by the sellers to the market so this is the next hypothesis and what do we do with this hypothesis we repeat the process we go ahead with more experiments and observations and we perform these uh, uh, these two operations of formulating hypothesis and checking them out through experiments or observations till we have uh, we reach a point where the hypothesis gets confirmed so suppose our hypothesis that the cost of transportation determines the quantity of food grains that is supplied to the market suppose we are able to prove this hypothesis in our study area so in that case we'll formulate a theory now this theory would say that the uh, cost of uh, or the price of a, of a transportation determines the amount of food grains that is supplied to the market but then it is also possible that this theory is only applicable to the current area of study it is not applicable everywhere else so in that case it will remain at the level of a theory but then if a theory stands the test of time so we test it in different locations we test it in different periods of time we test it under different circumstances and every time we find that it is actually the the uh, the, the price of transportation that determines the quantity of food grains that are supplied by the sellers to the market if that happens then we will upgrade the the theory to the level of a law and then we'll call it the law of say uh, governance of quantity of food grains supplied to the market another example from a very different field is that suppose you have a torch and this torch is not working how do you apply the scientific method now remember that the scientific method's aim is to help you get to the correct conclusion so your torch is not working and there could be n number of things that are wrong with the torch probably the batteries have died out probably the bulb has gotten a fuse probably the switch is not working probably the wires are broken there could be a number of things now we can apply scientific method to any observation and to any question so in this case the observation is that the torch is not working the question is why is the torch not working so we'll formulate certain hypothesis the first hypothesis is perhaps the battery is dead now how do you check whether the uh, whether this is the correct hypothesis will you change the battery or you charge the battery and check if the torch works now if the torch still does not work then our hypothesis that the battery is dead is wrong because if this hypothesis was correct the torch should have worked when you change the battery or when you charge the battery so we reject this hypothesis that the torch is not working because the battery is dead so then we come up with another hypothesis that the torch is not working because the bulb has been fused so we change the bulb so this is the experiment you change the bulb and check if the torch works and you find through this experiment that the the torch still does not work which means that the bulb was not fused because you have changed the bulb and in that case, so one by one we are formulating a hypothesis we are testing the hypothesis and we are accepting or rejecting the hypothesis so if the bulb is not fused then perhaps 
the switch is not working. So in that case, the experiment is you change the switch and then check if the torch is working. And now uh, through this experiment, you come to know that the torch is working. So in that case, you can through this method of testing out different assumptions, different hypotheses, one by one, you can reach to a conclusion about why uh, why you were uh, observing the observation that you were observing. That is, through uh, by uh, by looking at all of these hypotheses one by one, you can come to the conclusion that your torch was not working because its switch was malfunctioning which you could not have done if you looked at all of these different aspects at the same time. So if you have a torch that is not working and you wanted to check the bulb, you wanted to check the battery, you wanted to check the switch, you wanted to check the wires, everything at the same point of time, then it would have been very difficult to come to the conclusion or especially the right conclusion about why your torch is not working. Now similarly, in the field of economics, there are a number of questions there are a number of observations and the economist uses the, the scientific method to understand or to explain why a certain thing is behaving in the way it is doing. So we have observations about things such as inflation. Why does inflation occur? Why do we have unemployment in the society? And all of these questions are understood through the scientific method. And if any of these theories stands the test of time, then we say that we have come up with a law of economics. So if you wanted to understand how an economist thinks, it is important to know the scientific principle and to deploy scientific principle in different circumstances. Now, in the case of economics, uh, the experiments are in a number of cases natural experiments. Now, natural experiment means that, uh, especially because economics has uh, got a lot to do with different people. So you cannot say, say, subjugate a person to malnutrition or you cannot subjugate a person to poverty just to test if uh, a certain observation uh, uh, is because of a certain hypothesis, because there are human costs involved. You, uh, if you wanted to, to check if the price of crude oil has got something to do with, say, an observation X, you cannot just go ahead and increase the price of crude oil. Because one, in a number of cases, you will not have access to the power to increase the price of crude oil. And two, because of the human costs that are involved. So the economist, in a number of cases, makes use of natural experiments. And what is a natural experiment? Uh, out there in the nature, even without us doing anything, there are variations. So suppose somebody wanted to understand the role of poverty, he or she can look at two different areas, one in which more and more number of people are poor and the other area where people are less poor. Or if somebody wanted to understand the, uh, the impact of increase of price of crude oil, then they only have to look at those periods of time, such as wars, where the price of crude oil goes up. So these natural experiments can be made use of in understanding and checking any hypothesis. And in the scientific method, we also make use of assumptions and models. Why? Because if you look at the scientific method, you will find that there are a number of hypotheses that need to be tested. And if we do not make certain assumptions, then there will be so many number of hypotheses that it will be very difficult to check any of those. So for instance, if you wanted to check if poverty has got something to do with the amount of education that people receive. So, and uh, when you are doing any experiment or when you are looking at natural experiment, then you then it is possible that not only are these people poor, but probably they are also living in, say, a nation with a very different uh, political principle. So we are looking at one, uh, one society that is living in a capitalist country and another society that is living in a communist country. Now, if a number of 
things are different between both of these societies then we cannot pinpoint whether the amount of education that people are receiving is because of uh, the poverty or not so we will have to make the assumption that everything else being constant poverty has so and so impact on education and so this is an assumption that we need to make use of similarly we also make use of a number of models now what is a model a model is a simplified uh, depiction of reality so for instance if you look at uh, say uh, the climate of india then a model would say that okay in the uh, months of uh, may or june you have the summer season in the months of uh, december and january you have the winter season but the reality could be different the reality could be that in place of december and january uh, being winter months you could be having a winter from say 15th of november or a winter that extends till the end of uh, of february in certain years but then if we wanted to discern the role of something we will have to simplify things if it is very much complicated then and then looking at Uh, or making uh, pinpointed conclusions would become more difficult and so we make use of models which are simplified versions of reality a model can be defined as a simplified description especially a mathematical one of a system or a process to assist calculations and predictions so it is a simplified description so you are removing most of the complexity especially a mathematical one now why uh, why do we we prefer mathematical models because a mathematical model makes it much more easier to predict things it has a better predictive power so it is a, a model is a simplified description especially a mathematical one of a system or a process and why do we make a model to assist calculations and predictions so it makes calculations easy and it gives us a certain amount of predictive power So why do we use models? Models are simple to understand by removing the specifics. So in the case of the climatic model, you are removing the specifics about which date uh, or say on which date what was the temperature. We are just looking at a very simplified depiction where we say that so and so months are summer months, so and so months are winter months, and then spring and autumn and so on. So. they make things simple to understand by removing the specifics they help us concentrate on the most relevant variables so for instance if we wanted to uh, to check whether uh, uh, say a, a a a particular activity is more in the summer season and less in the winter season so if we made use of this model we do not have to uh, concern ourselves with what was the exact temperature on that day what was the exact humidity on that day now remember that all these different factors could also have a bearing on our observation but then by removing all of these uh, variables we are making it simple to understand and we are uh, concentrating on the most relevant variables it promotes reflection and clarification of ideas it gives a certain amount of explanatory power so through a model we can explain things and we can even predict things what is going to happen in the future if we have a simplified model it is easy to to understand things it is easy to explain things to others and it is also easy to predict what is going to happen in the near future but then when we are simplifying things we are also removing a lot of details so this is a limitation of models most of the models are approximations they are not exactly how uh, the real world functions and remember that this is okay because we we made a model knowing that we are unable to comprehend the complete reality and model will help us understand the reality and so there will be certain limitations then there is a trade off between accuracy and predictive power and simplicity now if you have a model and you want to be extremely accurate then you will have to consider all the smaller variables that were also playing a part but then if you include all the smaller variables then your model becomes so complicated that it becomes difficult to comprehend and difficult to explain and probably even difficult to deploy 
So there is always a trade-off between accuracy and predictive power on one hand and simplicity. With more predictive power, complexity goes up, which might defeat the purpose of the model. So let us now have a look at certain models that we commonly use in economics. The first one is the circular flow diagram. It is a visual model of the economy that shows how money flows through markets among households and firms. So circular flow diagram is a visual model. It is a model and it helps you to visualize things. It is a model of the economy and it shows how money flows through markets among households and firms. So what does this, mo uh, this model say? This model says that there are two big entities. There are firms and there are households. Firms are those uh, entities that produce and sell goods and services. So they are the producers and they are the sellers of goods and services. Now to produce these goods and services, they hire and make use of factors of production. So you can understand a firm easily by visualizing say an industry. Now an industry is manufacturing certain goods or it is providing certain services and to manufacture these goods and services, it requires labor. So how will it get labor? It will hire labor. It will employ people. So a firm is the, uh, is the set of entities that produce goods, that produce and sell goods and services. And for production, they hire and use the factors of production. Factors of production means they are using land, labor, and capital. The other big entity is the households. Households are those entities that buy and consume goods and services. So these are the buyers of goods and services. They own and sell the factors of production. So the households own their own labor. And they sell their labor to the firms to help them produce things and in return, they will be getting a salary. Or the households are those entities that own the land. And they will make this land available to the firms in exchange for, say, a rent. So households buy and consume goods and services. They own and sell the factors of production. So there are these two entities. Now, these two entities interact in the market. And remember that market is the place where buyers and sellers are coming together but markets are places where buyers and sellers of a particular good or service come together so in this case we can clarify that there are two different markets there are markets for the goods and services now goods and services are those things that the firms are producing and the firms are selling on the other hand the households buy these goods and services so in the market for goods and services, the goods and services are sold by the firm in this market and they are bought by the households. Now, when the, when the households are buying the goods and services from this market, they will have to make a spending. They will have to pay something. So let us say that they are paying in rupees. So one rupee is moving from this household to the market because certain portion of goods and services are being bought by the households in this market. And this market is then channelizing this rupee to the firm. And the firm is getting this money in the form of revenue. So this is the revenue of the firm. And why is the, the firm getting this revenue? Because it is selling the goods and services. So this is one market in which the firms and the households interact with each other. Now, if you do not have any other market, if you have only one market, then there will be a situation where the households will very soon end up all the money that they have, all the money will get accumulated here and the households will only have certain goods and services that they have bought from the firms. So, after a while, this economy will stop. Now, the reason why the economies do not stop is that we have another market which is known as the market for the factors of production. Now in the market for the factors of production, the firms buy. 
and the household sell. Now, what do the firms buy? The firms buy the factors of production. So the firms are buying the labor of people who reside in the households. Or the firms are buying the land or they are renting the land that is owned by different people. So the firms are buying here. And when the firms are buying, they will be spending the money that they have. So in this case, the rupee is moving from the firms through this market of production into the households. The, so the firms are paying the wages, rent and profit. So if there is a labor that is being uh, purchased, so in exchange for labor, the firms will be paying wages. If there is a land that, uh, that has been uh, purchased or rented, then the firms will be paying the rent. If there is a capital that has been purchased, then the firms will be paying for it through their profits. So in this market for factors of production, the firms are buying the factors of production and they are selling uh, or uh, they are paying for it through wages, rent or profit. On the other hand, these factors of production are being made available through the households. So the households are selling land, labor and capital and in exchange for it, they are getting the income. So this is a circular flow diagram because if we look at say the flow of money, it moves from households through the market to the firms, then through the second market back to the household. So it completes a complete circle. On the other hand, if you look at the flow of inputs and outputs, we will find that the inputs and outputs are going through this circle. So in both the cases, the circle is complete. And so this is the circular flow diagram of an economy. Packet of milk. Identify this transaction on the circular flow diagram. Now, what is hurry in this case? Hurry is a part of the household. And hurry is paying a dairy for the packet of milk. Now, dairy is producing and selling this packet of milk. So the entity that produces and sells goods and services is the firm. And the entity that buys these goods and services is the household. So in this example, the dairy is the firm and Hari is the household. And Hari is paying 60 rupees for this packet of milk. So the first thing to, to understand is whether this is the market for goods and services or whether this is the market for the factors of production. So the answer is in this market, the firm is selling things to the household. And so when the firm is selling things to the household, it is the market for goods and services. So in this market for goods and services, Hari who belongs to the household is doing the spending of 60 rupees in this market and the firm which is the, the dairy is getting a revenue of 60 rupees and if you look at the flow of inputs and outputs the firm is selling the goods and so uh, the the good in this case which is a packet of milk and the household which is hurry is buying this good which is a packet of milk now where does hurry get this money from so hurry earns say 15000 rupees working as a waiter in a restaurant. Now, identify this transaction on the circular flow diagram. In this case, Hari is earning something, working as a waiter, which means that Hari is providing his labor. So he is selling his labor and in return for selling his labor, he is getting 15,000 rupees. And who is Hari selling this labor to? He is selling this labor to a restaurant. So in this case, the firm is the restaurant or the, the restaurant is the firm because firms hire and use the factors of production. In this case, the restaurant is hiring the factor of production, which is hurry and using hurry as a waiter. So the restaurant is the firm. Hurry is the household because hurry is owning and selling the factor of production, which in this case is his own labor. This interaction is occurring in the market for the factors of production where the firms buy and the households sell. Now, Hari is selling his labor to 
the firm. So the firm is procuring the factor of production, which is labor. And the fifteen thousand rupees that Hari gets is his income that he is deriving from this market of four factors of production. And this income is coming through these firms. So the firms are paying this money in the form of wages. So the restaurant is paying wages, and these wages become the income of Hari, who is the household, a part of the household. So this is the circular flow diagram. Now, why is this a model? Why do we call it a model? Because this is a very simplified representation of the working of the economy. The economy is not this simple, because this circular flow diagram we do not see government anywhere. So it does not consider the role of government. The government may be providing, uh, may be take, uh, collecting taxes. The government may be providing subsidies. The government may be putting certain controls on these markets and on Forms and households, but the circular flow diagram is neglecting all of these issues. So it is possible that out of this revenue there is a certain portion that is going to the government. When the households are spending, probably the government is taking a share. When the households are getting income, probably there is an income tax that is being paid. But a circular flow diagram is neglecting all of These entry cases and is simplifying things, and so this is a model. It also does not consider the role of international trade because in this model we are considering that this economy only comprises of these two entities, the firms and the households, and we are not considering those goods and services that are being brought from outside. So it neglects the imports and the exports. another model that we routinely make use of is the production possibilities frontier production possibilities frontier is a graph that shows the combinations of output that the economy can can possibly produce given the available factors of production and the available production technology so it is a graph or it is a chart and what it, what does it show it shows the combination of output that the economy can Uh, possibly produce. So it shows us what are the combination of different outputs that the economy can produce, with the constraint of the available factors of production and the available production technology. So given the available factors of production and given the production technology of the time and place. what are the different combinations of output that can be produced is shown by the production possibilities frontier now let us say that there is an economy and for uh, simplicity sake it can uh, there are only two goods that can be produced with the technology and with the factors of production the first good is say computers and the second good is say cars now we are simplifying things because we are saying that in this economy we have only these two items that are being produced there is no third item because we are trying to understand how uh, the factors of production are allocated so we make the simplification that there are only two items then the, the second sim- simplification is that any factor of production can be used in making either of these goods so for instance if there is a worker we can use that worker to produce computers or we can use that worker to produce cars now this again is a big simplification because in a number of cases the workers who are trained to make computers might not be that trained in making cars but then this is a simplification that we are using similarly a number of items or uh, that are used in the manufacturing of cars are very different from those that are used in making of computers so for instance we use silicon in the in the uh, ic chip that is there in the computers now silicon is hardly used in cars but then when we are making this model of production possibilities frontier we are saying that any factor of production can be used in making either of these two goods now suppose the economy decides that we are only going to produce computers 
In that case, it produces zero cards and it produces 3000 computers. So that is one production possibility. If you do not make any cards, if you put all your resources into making computers, you will make 3000 computers. On the other hand, if you put all the resources into making cars, you will make say 1000 cars. So this is the other extreme of this production possibility frontier. Now, if you spend say 50% of uh, your practice of production into making computers and 50% into making cars, then there will be some other point. If you spend say 10% and 90%, there will be some other point. So all the points, that represent what all things can be manufactured is shown by this line. So a point such as this will tell us that the economy is currently producing 700 cars and 1200 computers. Similarly, this point is also possible. All the points that are inside the curve to the left of the curve are also possible but we say that these are inefficient use of resources because the resources are not being put to complete use so for instance the economy might say that we will be producing say one computer and one car however they could have even produced 700 uh, cars and 1200 computers but in place of producing 700 and 1200 items they are only producing one so that is possible but that is inefficient so the production possibility frontier tells us the most efficient uh, production of two different goods that the economy can make. Any points that are to the right of this curve are an impossible combination because the resources and technology are not available to make so, many, so much amount of goods or services. So this is a simplified model that we refer to as the production possibilities frontier. Now, such a model helps us understand the principles of economics. Because here, what we are emphasizing is that the society is facing a trade-off. What is that trade-off? The society wants more of cars and more of computers, but there is a limit. And so, uh, the society can either have more computers or it can have more cars. So, it will have to make a trade-off between computers and cars. The second thing is that trade-offs are, le are leading to cost and cost is what you give up to get something. So in this case, you are giving up 3000 computers to make 1000 cars. So the cost of 1000 cars is 3000 computers or the cost of 3000 computers is 1000 cars. So this is cost. So this model is helping us understand concepts such as trade-offs and concepts such as cost. The cost in this case is the opportunity cost. If the society wants more computers, it will get less number of cars. And when the society chooses to make only computers, the best workers for car production are also used in making computers. But they may not be that good in producing computers because they are not trained in making in producing computers which produces the bow shaped curve putting these workers into car production will not only greatly impact uh, the number of computers produced but will also greatly increase the number of cars produced what we are saying here is that specialization is also being depicted on this curve because of this shape now in place of producing 3000 computers suppose you produce, suppose this society produced uh, say 2009 100 computers. So we'll get a curve like this. And the point where this line cuts this curve is this. So what we are seeing here is that just by reducing 100 computers we are getting say close to 200 cars. Why? Because when we are when we are leaving out certain uh, workers from computers into making of cars, it is 
in 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 a number of cases they will be those workers who are more capable and willing to produce cars and so we are seeing an effect of specialization if the society decides to make only one thing then even those people who are not that specialized to make that item will be used in the manufacturing of that item which will not be the most efficient utilization of resources so we are seeing an inefficient utilization of resources when the society chooses to make only computers or only cars so this is another concept that we are observing through this curve now why is this a model because this is a simplified representation of the working of the economy almost no economy is there that only produces two goods most of the economies produce hundreds or thousands or millions of goods but then to understand the role of uh, allocation of resources or to understand the opportunity cost or to understand specialization we have looked at an economy, economy that makes only two items similarly not all factors of production can be equally deployed in making of these two items but then this is another simplification that we have made but these simplifications permit an easy grasp of economic ideas of scarcity efficiency trade off opportunity cost and economic growth how economic growth suppose there is uh, the availability of a better technology and so the economy in place of making 3000 computers can now make 4000 computers now remember that when we started with the production possibility frontier we said that given the available factors of production and the available production technology so this is an assumption in this model what happens when we break these assumptions if we say that we make more people available or we say that we make available a better technology so in that case the total amount of computers that can be produced now will increase from 3000 to 4000 now when this happens the curve the the production possibility frontier it shifts from here to this red line when that happens now if you look at these two points earlier the society could uh, could have 700 uh, cars and 1200 computers but now this point is also possible that the society can have 750 computer uh, 750 cars that is more number of cars and 1400 computers that is more number of computers so now the econ this society can have more computers and more cars even though the technology has only has only increased the number of computers that can be made now this is an example of an economic growth now in the economic growth more and more number of people can have access to more and more items so in place of this point 700 and 1200 now we have 750 and 1400 this is an example of economic growth we can understand economic growth by looking at this production possibility frontier next let us have a look at the economic analysis now economics does analysis at two different levels the first is the level of microeconomics microeconomics is the study of how households and firms make decisions and how they interact in the markets so in the case of microeconomic analysis we will concentrate on firm on a single firm or we will concentrate on say a single household and we will concentrate on a market in which these are interacting in macroeconomics we look at the impacts of all of these different combinations by all the households and all the firms in all the markets so macroeconomic phenomena including inflation unemployment and economic growth so in microeconomics we are looking at things at a micro level at a small level so we are asking the the question how do you decide or how do i decide whether whether to buy item 1 or item 2 or how does a firm decide whether to produce item 1 or produce item 2 and how much amount to produce so questions such as these are asked in the field of microeconomics so it concentrates on either one household or say a firm or on a market macroeconomics looks at things 
from a wider level and it looks at the impact of the interactions and uh, the activities of all the households all the firms and all the markets in the economy and so in that case we can understand concepts such as inflation unemployment economic growth and so on another uh, aspect of analysis is that economics can make use of positive analysis or it can make use of normative analysis now positive analysis is an analysis that claims that the attempt to describe the world is as it is as a scientist such as minimum wage legislations increase unemployment so in this case we are not saying whether this should be done or that should be done we are just giving things as a matter of fact that in this case minimum wage legislations increase unemployment this is a fact that we are putting up so this is a positive analysis a normative analysis claims that attempt to prescribe how the world should be as a policy advisor so if i say the same sentence and if i put it as minimum wage legislations should be removed then i am talking about a normative analysis because i am talking about the way things should be it should be removed now all that being said there are certain field realities also that we need to be aware of economic advice is not always followed sometimes other considerations such as votes or private profits or lethargy hold this way so if there is an economic analysis that says that minimum wage legislations should be removed it does not mean that the minimum wage legislations will be removed because you also have to look at other factors such as politics or on the level of society of, of that area and so on the second thing is that the economists themselves disagree a lot why because of differences in which scientific theory to follow differences in their value judgments example whether to to choose efficiency or equality because in a number of cases the economists themselves are doing a normative analysis so for instance um, a person uh, who who puts uh, much faith in increasing efficiency might say that minimum wage legislations should be removed on the other hand another economist who emphasizes on the level of uh, or or on the quality of life of these laborers might say no minimum wage legislations are extremely important otherwise these people might get exploited now the both of these economists are correct in their own opinions they are correct in their own places but they have a difference in the value judgments whether they are trying to emphasize the efficiency of the economy or whether they are trying to emphasize the level of equality that is there in the society so these are certain reasons because of which the economists might themselves disagree so you have to take everything with a pinch of salt so in this lecture we had a look at how an economist thinks what are the different kinds of models what are the different kinds of analysis that we make use of certain terms that this uh, that belongs to the uh, to the field and so on so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind